Um, so yeah, like uh, James said, um, I work for a company called Amber. A little background on me though, um, before, before I worked for Amber, um, I started in mobile around 2003. Uh, making games on, on J2ME and Brew, for those of you that are old school and remember those, those platforms, um, for a company called Jamdat. Jamdat got bought by EA in 2005, so I worked for EA uh, until 2012, uh, making a bunch of mobile games for them, uh, including uh, Simpsons, Simpsons Tapped Out. And then I went to Disney in 2012 and worked for Disney, running their co-development and licensing business for about four years, um, and now I'm on the indie side, so I'm, I'm working for a developer, so I've, I've transitioned over to, uh, to the dark side, I guess. Um, so we're a game development and studio services agency. Uh, Amber's been around since 2013. Uh, Amber has offices in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and our core uh, team is based in Bucharest. And we have a pretty significant team there. We have 260 people. And uh, that's made up of QA engineers, production designers. And for many, many years, we had done um, work for higher outsourcing, like, like James was, was, was referencing, uh, for things like development, co-development, porting, QA. And uh, we had sort of accumulated through that process all the necessary pieces of a team that would be required to do live ops. So. Um, Recently, recently in about the past year, we've really sensed the business need from uh, publishers and developers um, to take their long tail games or their games that are sort of entering that stage of like somewhere between maintenance and sunset um, and do live ops on them because their core teams are getting really expensive, our team's in Bucharest, so we can afford to step in uh, at a relatively low cost. Um, so that's the business I'm gonna talk about today. And I'm going to talk to you about our philosophy. We have, a live, we have what we call the Live Ops Playbook. The Live Ops Playbook is a, is a document that we put together, basically taking all the information, collective information from the brains of people that have worked on mobile free-to-play games for many, many years. Um, and I'm going to share with you some of that stuff. Um, and then two specific case studies on, on two casual games that I have experience in. I figured it was Casual Connect, so I might as well pick two casual games. Um, and then that's what we're going to talk about. So at Amber, uh, our perspective on um, the service that we provide in regards to live ops is, is uh, optimizing user engagement and minimizing operating costs. So um, the way we optimize user engagement is through successful live ops, preventing player churn, uh, creating long-term, short-term retention, monetization, all the things that normally go into live ops, which I'm going to talk about. One of the unique benefits we can bring to the table and we bring to the table in regards to Operating costs is we're cheaper because we're in Bucharest, and then also um, we like to bring tool sets to bear. So I think um, Lance was talking a little bit about bringing tool sets to optimize live ops and make it more flexible. We're firm believers in that technology, um, and a lot of teams are, are very bloated in their live operations, and they just throw humans at it, and it ends up getting really hard and ungainly to, to manage games, and, and we're firm believers that you can optimize that by uh, lowering your operating costs through technology. Um, so our, our business here started with Disney. Um, Disney gave us three projects to run live ops on, and we're still running these games today. Um, we have uh, a game that we're running for Gameloft called uh, Gods of Rome, um, and we worked with Kixai for about 1.5 years uh, on their mobile game, uh, um, War Commander Rogue Assault. All right, so I wanted to get through the intro super fast so we can get into the good stuff. So from my perspective and Amber's perspective, Live Ops is running games of service, which I, all you guys know, but what does that mean? Uh, in, in my uh, easiest definition of the term, it is giving users something to come back to every single day. And some people have talked about, well, that's the emotional connection, or there's an aspirational connection, um, regardless of what the connection is, and I think those are both great examples, um, it's really bringing users back and, and giving them a reason to come back. Because if they don't come back, then um, being a free game, you're not going to be able to monetize off them and you don't have a business. So at, at its simplest form, is preventing churn and creating engagement to drive, uh, drive your retention. Uh, from, from a very high level perspective, when we're looking at a game to take it over, uh, we'll usually look at the marketplace and try to target the right type of game before we go to a partner, so we don't just go to a partner and go, 
hey, let us take over one of your games. We, we, we do some pre-research to find the right type of game, and the things that we look at, the three main um, key things that we look at are uh, acquisition, retention, monetization. I'm sure you guys all know that. ARM, it's the three-legged stool that LiveOps stands on top of. We sort of look at it a different way, though, because we're, we're approaching it from a service standpoint. Um, we look at acquisition not only as like, hey, is the game getting downloads, but um, like what type of audience does the game have? Like, is it a branded game that is authentic for the audience? Are they getting the right type of users? Because there's a lot of work you can do in live ops to optimize a game. Some games uh, are DOA because they don't have the right connection or overlap of gameplay and brand. Uh, an example of that would be, you know, the Simpsons Tapped Out, which I worked on, was a fantastic overlap of um, brand and gameplay. Everybody wants to control Springfield and all the characters within Springfield, and the Simpsons nailed that with the writers and the art and, and the music and the VO. Uh, another example is Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go nailed um, the aspirational connection of the brand with what you want from gameplay. You know, another Pokemon game, uh, the Match 3 Pokemon game, didn't really nail that. So. Um, that's one thing that we look at especially is like, is it the right user proposition? Are they bringing in the right type of users? Does it have that opportunity? Uh, retention, obviously, super important. I would say it's arguably the most important stat. Um, we look at early things like the Fatui. Is the Fatui broken? Is there, are there clarity issues? You know, I think, uh, I can't remember the talk, but someone mentioned that they had, uh, I think it was roller coaster. they had a, uh, an improvement in the store when they made a UI tweak. Like crazy stuff like that, you can just make a clarity tweak and all of a sudden you see a boost in, in the engagement and, and uh, follow through of your game events. And then of course monetization. Monetization is super important. This is free to play. We're monetizing off 1-2% to of our user base and you have to be able to drive uh, consistent monetization, be able to sell to people at the right point, give them what they want, and also think of new types of monetization. Ads, super important. Um, but also other types of monetization. So if you have a consumable system, one thing I would recommend, like consider a durable system um, just to test some stuff out. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that in Frozen Freefall, which is one of our case studies. So the way we approach live ops uh, when, we, when we look at a product is we will set forth a bet based on a feature or a build or content. Um, and we'll look at that cohort, whether it's a single cohort or whether it's A-B testing uh, multiple cohorts. And then we'll look at that audience and make a bet and say, okay, we think we're going to hit these KPIs or this follow through with this feature. Then we put that in the marketplace, we get that data back, we look at that data, and then we determine how far off we are from our original estimations. Um, we're firm believers that game designers are super important to the process of live ops. Product managers are super important, but um, you know, the, 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 the game KPIs are going to tell you what and where you usually have a problem, um, but it's not going to tell you how to fix it, generally. So um, the, that's where you need really strong free-to-play game designers that can come in, look at something, and go, oh, wait, we have a drop-off there. We're not hitting as, as big as we wanted to. Maybe the UI is confusing, or maybe we put it in the wrong place, or maybe we're not selling the right thing. Um, so that's super important. We spend a lot of time looking at the game from, from a product, user, game design standpoint. And then after we sort of optimize those things, we make a new bet, we release it back into the marketplace, measure that cohort, rinse and repeat. And that's generally our approach to live operations and optimization. Uh, and then uh, quarterly, we will usually attack new features, um, new content, uh, big, big events, um, and have that stuff sort of planned on the outside of that onion, of that core rinse and repeat onion, uh, to drive um, value for, for our uh, service. Um, some common things that we look at that people tend to miss that um, might be a good thing for, for you guys to look at as you're looking at your games. Um, I already mentioned Fatui, extremely important, especially for short-term retention, day one to day three. Like generally, if it's day one to day, day three and like you don't have something crazy broken in your game, it's most likely the Fatui um, that, is, that is like uh, driving people out. So you have to sort of look at the progression of your game events and see where people are dropping out. Dynamic difficulty, uh, one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing, especially since we have a lot of match threes in our, in our catalog, is uh, thinking about ways to automate difficulty and ways to make things easier so you don't have to have a human going in and balancing and creating new mechanics, um, basically thinking of a way to, to, to generate levels through machine learning. Um, special events are super important. Special events drive so much ROI. 
um, on these games. And, and you know, I think in the PlayFab catalog I was reading, there's a big section on special events. It's very important. Um, it's, it's actually really cool that that's in there because um, I would say, like, out of all the live ops stuff that you guys are looking at, if you don't have special events in your games or limited time events or or special things to bring people back, um, you're you're missing a huge piece of the pie. Um, two, you know, or, or or four new new types of monetization. So we talked about ads. We talked about uh, durables versus consumables, and then reducing operating costs. Like, not many people talk about the making the sausage part of this, but um, you know, everybody's focused on the optimizing the game. There's ways you can probably optimize your team. Like, look at, the, look at the cost of your team. How expensive is it? Do you need, are you guys spending too much time doing stuff? Is there some technology that you can create to help you get faster at stuff? Um, that's extremely important, and a lot of times people sort of miss that. We're operationally founded and engineering founded. Like, that's our core competency, so we spend a lot of time thinking about that stuff. All right, let's get into some case studies. So, um, Amber didn't work on Frozen Freefall. I worked on Frozen Freefall when I was at Disney, and I've sort of taken the learnings from, from working on that game and thrown it into our Live Ops playbook. In addition to that, um, we have uh, Mihai Pohantu, who, who uh, was head of Game Ops at Disney, and Ryan Winterholler, who was executive producer on uh, Frozen Freefall. These are, we're all now part of the, the Live Operations team. Um, for those of you that don't know this, this game, I'm sure you all know the movie, but for those of you that don't know this game, this, this game has done over 150 million downloads. Um, it is uh, Disney's most successful uh, free-to-play published game, um, I think to this day, and it's still probably generating the majority of the revenue for them on a daily basis. I don't know, I don't see those numbers, but I'm, I'm guessing. Um, and at, at its heyday, like we had four million DAU, um, you know, we had amazing um, retention. We had we had 15% day 30, and that even I think went out to like a day 90 of like 8%. Um, and we had some pretty good ARP, ARP DAO for a casual game. Um, we had around four cents at its lowest point, and then when we ran events, we had as high as 15, sometimes 25 cents on a single day, um, and a, a $7.50 average revenue per paying user. Um, and this game just had massive volume, like this game was an event, so, you know, while the brand and the authenticity of this game fitting well to the market and sort of the audience, the, the female audience that plays Match 3s, worked in our favor, what made this game a success, I think, was the successful live ops, and I'm going to talk about two, I'm going to talk about three things that I think we did really well in this game that led to its success. So the first one was um, every event that we released, um, or every update that we released monthly, we generally do a, a release every four weeks, we made sure to add new mechanics. And a lot of puzzle games at the time were just taking their old mechanics and sort of combining them to create emergent gameplay. Um, we made sure that we made it a pillar of ours that said every update is going to come with a new mechanic. And that really taught our audience to come back and experience those new puzzle pieces that they could play to basically get a new experience. And I think this is probably one of the main features why uh, our retention was so awesome on this game is because we trained our audience to come back for these updates because they knew they were always going to get something fresh and new. Um, conversion. So I was talking about trying out some different types of monetization techniques. In this game, we did something really interesting, and no one was doing this at the time. And to this day, I don't think a lot of people have tried this, which is we had 200 levels in the core playthrough of Frozen Freefall where you have to go to, you know, start of the movie to building to get to the end, of, which was Elsa's ice castle. Um, and if you had finished through that playthrough, uh, we released these seasonal maps like Valentine's Day, Christmas, Halloween, um, and you could play those maps in order if you had beaten those core levels. But if you hadn't beaten those core levels, we would let you buy those little mini maps for $1.99. And what was really interesting about this was uh, we unlocked a whole new uh, payer base. So there were people in our uh, user base that had never paid before that bought these maps because they were durable purchases and not consumable purchases. Um, and I think it just goes to like the psychology of spenders, where like some people just don't want to buy coins or power-ups because they know they're temporary. Um, we unlocked a whole new user base here, and these were quite profitable, and we ended up doing this um, to the end of the product, and I think they're still releasing these to this day. Um, the most successful thing that we ran, though, was, was this limited time event. And the first one we ran was Build Elsa's Ice Castle. It was on its own little map. We advertised for it a week in advance so people knew it was coming. And we wanted to make sure that we hit everybody on that um, day seven cohort. 
um, so they knew on the weekend it was coming. Um, it was special. We spent about two months designing this event, uh, and we knew that it was going to come, and it was going to be super high presentation, super rich. You're going to see the castle build. You're going to get some awesome rewards. Uh, and we saw some really great stats. We saw 60% uh, of the total users engaged with this event, uh, and it drove over 200% in revenue day over day when the event was running. So when I say events can drive a significant amount of revenue for your products, I'm not kidding. Like when we saw these numbers, like we had to double check. Like we're like, wait, what? Like that's crazy. Um, and then you know I can't show you the the official stats because um, Disney lawyers would, would kill me. But um, I, I pulled this from uh, from App Annie, and you can sort of see here where we ran the first event. We were on a, a live ops decline uh, in regards to revenue and downloads. And App Annie's a little squishy in regards to revenue. We actually made more revenue than this when we ran our event. Um, but you can see that spike, that, that first spike right there is the first time we ran the event. And then subsequently, every weekend after that, they ran that event and then they started running new events and it basically saved our service. You could see the service was in decline and then it, all of a sudden it's sustaining. Um, so something really important to think about when you, when you, when you design your live op games. Um, all right, inside out thought bubbles. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about design. And um, when it comes to free to play design, uh, we love this term, rational game design, which I don't, I don't know if you guys know this term, but um, there's tons of, tons of articles online. There's some um, great articles on Gama Sutra that you can read about it. It was a, a game design theory that was made popular at Ubisoft in the early to mid 2000s. Um, and it's basically the idea that you can objectify game design through spreadsheets and thinking about how you apply elements of game design to create variability. So what it allows you to do instead of just going, oh, I think this level needs some more harder obstacles, or I need this level, I think this level could be, you know, have five more moves to be a little bit easier. It allows you to sort of quantify those things, create maximum differentiation in the spreadsheet, track that, and then test out your assumptions in gameplay. And this serves two purposes. One, um, it sort of scientifically lays everything out for you, so you have something to tweak versus like, oh, it's harder, it's easier, right? Um, and then two, once you get to the point of, you get this, uh, you know, changes into the marketplace, you can kind of come back to it and have a historical uh, tracking record of, of what you started with, where you went to, and tie that to difficulty. So as it relates to puzzle games, um, this, is the, this is the technique that we use for all of our puzzle games to balance. Five minutes. Um, so then what we do is we, we assign these values, then we have the game designers go in, play, kind of tweak them, almost like you know, a, a DJ tweaks a synthesizer when they're tweaking their music, and then we have our assumptions, right? So we go, okay, this level is gonna be super easy as marked by that first level. Uh, it's gonna have this many attempts um, on average, and basically you track all your users that play that level, how many times does it take them to win? or get past it, right? And we're gonna say, on average, out of all our users, they're gonna get past it in two or less tries. That's an easy-ish level. Um, so then we design the level that way, you know, we add like not many colors, we, we don't add any blockers, and, and the, the way to beat the level is mostly deterministic, which means it's skill-based. Like if you're just a, a pretty good player, you're gonna beat it. Um, then what we do is we say, well, later in the experience, we want to create a harder level because we want to pinch the user. Maybe you want them to spend at that point. Um, maybe they just want more challenge because at a certain point, you can't just have all easy levels because your users are going to get bored and have what's called success churn, which is also a bad thing. Um, so let's make this level difficult. We're going to add some more colors. We're going to add some blockers. We're going to get a little more challenging. And the parameters to beating the level are mostly going to be statistic-based, which means there's going to be a high level of chance. Uh, and in general, in my opinion, a free-to-play game um, that's successful and that can drive long-term value, you have to have that element of chance. And it's the reason why you know, runners don't have very high ARP DAO and, and um, monetization generally is because they're mostly skill-based and uh, Twitch-based. And if you're really, really good at runners, you're never going to have to buy a, a power-up or anything. And it's why games like RPGs and games like... Clash Royale and puzzle games, which have a bit of deterministic or a bit of statistic value and like the randomness of winning um, drive higher value. Um, so then after we put that on the marketplace, we get that data, we get it back, um, and then we look at what, what, what happened. Um, in, one in the first case, 
you know, our target is uh, lower than what we got, so we're going to have to balance that because we're getting some churn. People are leaving. Um, in the second case, um, it's actually easier than we thought it than we thought it was going to be. So people aren't spending as much. The ARPU per level on that level isn't as high as we want it to be. Um, so we're going to have to make that a little bit difficult. So we're going to go into our game design spreadsheet and, and tweak it and add some things to make it a little more difficult. In the last case, it was a little bit harder than we wanted it to be, but at the end of the day, it's meeting our um, churn and average revenue. Uh, uh, per level sort of uh, statistics, so we're not going to change it at all. We're going to keep it the way it is. Um, and that's generally our approach. And, and when you think about this technique, uh, taking the scientific approach to game design and applying it to like a neural network or, uh, or you know, machine learning, it, it starts to become um, clear to understand how you can create a, mo a more automated system to, to balance difficulty and create level design. All right, that's it. Um, how long are you running an event when you say by the end of the event it was touching 60% of your um, active users? I mean, that's so that specific, what? So that specific event ran three days. Okay. It ran Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And, and that's adjusted globally as well? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 60% of the active users, not 60% of all, all downloads, 60% of the active users. Okay, 60% of the people who would have come back. Yes. Again. Over those three days. Over those three days. And then do you have a sense of what the incremental increase was? In, in revenue? Yeah, or, or just... It was 200%. Okay. Yeah, it was crazy. Okay. It was like, I, you know, I can't talk specifics, but it was like we had to double check the numbers. We thought there was a bug in the Apple system and, and, uh, and uh, Google system. Yeah, um, so in the beginning you mentioned Fatui. Uh, what is that? Oh, I'm sorry, did I not tell you? Uh, uh, first time user experience. So generally, um, in a free-to-play game, you have a first-time user experience, which is everything from like, the moment the user boots up to the moment they kind of get through the tutorial or get past like, that sort of intro period. Um, that's a super important part of your uh, live operations game, you know, your service-based game, because um, if you have any missteps in that process, you're going to lose those users. And that, that, that process is really for ushering new users through, getting to like the, the, the meat and potatoes of your game. So typically, when you have bad day one retention, um, that's, a, that's an early culprit. Like, go and look at your Fatui. Have, have game events tied to every single thing the user can interact with in that process and see where they're dropping off and, and measure that. Uh, and what does the ARM stand for? I, I saw that on your uh, slide. Acquisition, oh. retention, and monetization. I see. Got it. The okay, three-legged stool that we <laughs> think is the three-legged stool of live ops. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, how long between release and the first live ops event you ran in uh, Frozen Freefall? Oh, sh so that was crazy. That that was a long time. So it was. So we didn't run our first event until. 2016, and the game launched in two in December. 2013, so, so it was April 2016. Um, and I think it was one of those things where nobody was doing events in puzzle games. And I think we saw King, um, King ran an event and like we just were tracking their app any progress when they ran the event and we're like, whoa, that looks like that was, worked out well for them. So we decided to try it and it worked out well for us. But I think it's a common, like people don't think about casual games as needing events because, or at least puzzle games needing events, they think of more like a, a strategy slash RPG kind of thing. Um, we saw tremendous value in it. So I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't undersell that type of feature for whatever game mechanic you have. Hi there. Um, can you talk a bit more about success churn? That's, that seems to be an interesting concept because at the beginning of the game, you probably want all your player to keep succeeding. When is it time to slowly you know, turn the switch on and make, making them fail? So that, it's extremely important to, to look at your audience. And that's one of the things that we would track in the acquisition phase of looking at a product. Because um, it's, you know, one of the things that we saw at, at Disney, because we worked in so many kids IP, and we were bringing, um, we were bringing kids IP to more adult focused games like Match 3, um, we saw a lot of success churn where the audience would leave because of some reason. Um, 
In that case, you know, my theory was, and the designer, game designer's theory was that because the game wasn't focused on that audience, right? Nor did we want it to be focused on that audience because if we tried to make a kid's match three, it would probably not monetize very well. We'd probably have good retention, maybe we'd do something with ads, but I don't think it would have been as, as big a success. So there are situations like that where you're looking at the game events and you're seeing people leave maybe not by difficulty, right? So in a level event, Normally, you would see a high churn rate tied to high difficulty. If you see a high churn rate tied to low difficulty, it could be something else, like something's confusing, there's a bug, or maybe that whatever mechanic you have in that level is just not fun and people are leaving because it sucks. So you have to have a game designer to be able to come in and go, why do we have success churn, and kind of figure that out. Scott, thank you so much for, for, for speaking. Yeah, thank you.